Good to have Charity back, isn't it? We missed her. But the, the worship team rocked it. How was the eclipse? Where'd you go? It got real dark, huh? We just had it hazy, kind of creepy. It was very weird. I did. Morgan bailed us out. She had one extra pair. All right, if you need an envelope, raise your hand. Ushers will help you. It, does this mean spring's here? Are we good? Evan, what's your official word? Is it? Can I put the heavy flannels and long johns and stuff away? Two more days? <laughs> what? I played nine holes of golf Monday. And I'm as good as I ever was. <laughs> but remember, a bad round of golf is better than a good day at the office. Okay? Bless the Lord. All right, stand up. We'll pray. Or I'll pray over this offering. Father, we thank you. We confess that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want or lack any single good thing in our lives, in our homes. In Jesus' name, we worship you with this offering. We say to God be the glory. And Kevin, I reciprocate blessing upon your people. May their cup runneth over. May their cupboards be full. May their bodies be healthy. May they be blessed in the country and blessed in the city, coming and going. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Oliver, did you bring money? High five. <laughs> Come on, Evan. Give it up, buddy. Yay. Change a tire? Yeah. Is he good at that kind of stuff? Yes. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. What am I? Thank you, man. He had a little sting to that. Wow. <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> Open to Ephesians. Now, I need to tell a funny story before I preach. And I need to make sure Rachel hears because it will affect her. Today I'm entered, you know, my little guy Aaron. And uh, I don't know, this is the eighth, ninth time I've seen him probably. And uh, 
He has a habit of peeking in my kid's hope bag. He tries to be real sly about it because that's where I transport his donuts and little snacks and stuff. He was having a bad day today, so I took him away from everybody. It was just he and I. And I'm trying to get him to calm down. I'm talking to him about what happened and how he handle it and so forth. And he slowly began to diffuse. But he said, is that Takis in your bag? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I like these. I'll eat them later, man. This stuff makes me hungry. So I pull them out and give them to him. Uh, he reaches in my kid's hope bag and pulls out a can of Monster Energy drink. I don't know. Corey borrowed my truck the other day, so I was like, I don't drink that stuff. Could you imagine me drinking 12 ounces of that? <laughs> but he, he pulled it out and examined it and said, what is this? I said, something you're not going to be able to have. But Ellen, he put pressure on me. He stared at me and said, please, I just want to taste it. I'm just a man. I crumbled under the pressure of a nine-year-old. <laughs> Oliver's had it? So I let him take a couple sips. Well, it was a compromise. He, he wanted the whole can. I said, no, you're going to taste it because that's what you said you wanted to do. So he took two little sips of it, and it didn't take long for it to kick in. So I said, see that drinking fountain over there, son? <laughs> Go there and start diluting it. And Yeah, we, I made him dump it. No, no, what was in his system had to be diluted. The way, the way I get, got him to dump it is I said, what color is it? And he said, I think it's black. I said, I don't think it's black. So he, when he poured it out, he... I tricked the little guy, didn't I? The next 45 minutes was energy, full speed, and uh, I thought I would do the fa teacher a favor and, and let him run. And <laughs> Stephen's a witness, and Elijah is a witness. <laughs> so if the school calls, you don't know what happened, just... Just, you know, the eclipse has changed a lot of stuff. He went to speech therapy instead of class when I was done with him, so maybe he was able to... I couldn't find the Takis, and so I got him the, the Red Hot Cheetos, and he protested. And he said, I'm not, I don't want those. I said, not a problem. Put it back in my bag. And he saw in my bag the little juice bottle. And he said, who's that for? I said, that's for whoever eats these Cheetos. <laughs> he, st he still wouldn't budge. He wouldn't eat those Cheetos. So I just put the Cheetos in. And once again, I, after a couple tries, I gave him the juice. But as I walked him back to his classroom, he cool, leaned over and looked in my bag and said, I was just pranking you. I'll take the Cheetos. So when I dropped his little hyper self off today and I was walking out of the school, I hear him screaming my name down the hallway, Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott. And he has the speech therapist with him and he said, next week I want Cheetos. <laughs> I wonder, who's driving the bus here, man? I don't know. I just want to touch his life. And if it's Cheetos... I was bringing him donut holes. He likes donut holes. And then he said, I want sprinkles. So I got the donut holes with sprinkles on them. And I showed it to him, and he said, I don't want that. And I said, last week you said you wanted sprinkles on the donuts. He said, the sprinkles are touching the donut. <laughs> well, he has a touch of autism. So he wouldn't eat the donut hole because it had... And I thought, kid, kid. So Oliver, Oliver in Oakland got the donuts. Because if I buy him a couple, I get the kids a couple. And so the next day I went, or next week I went, and I got plain donut holes, and I asked him, 
I told her my little story, and I said, can you give me a little cup of sprinkles just so I can see what the deal is? And he didn't like the sprinkles. He wouldn't eat the sprinkles. So guess who ate the sprinkles? You know, they're good on everything. So I'm all loosened up for today. What can I do now? You know, there's a reason after 34 years of pastoring this church, I've never been in the nursery, not one service. And I, I, I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> have I ever been in the nursery? Other than to say hello and thank you, have I ever been in solid rock? Not unless that was the time they had food and then I was in there. And then I tend to wander in there. Okay. Guatemala. It's a machete. And I said, you hold it like this. <laughs> hey, didn't he? He, held, he went up and got it. And I got in trouble again. Yeah, yeah I like Pastor God's sword. <laughs> I said, wait, let me get a picture for your mother. She'll like this. <laughs> hey, I got some cool stuff. I have a rusty knife from Africa that is dull, but it will hurt you just the same. Oh, well. Did you find Ephesians yet, or you want to hear more of my stories? Well, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Man, we had good church Sunday. Now, this one here did communion and made everybody cry. And the Holy Ghost was just going, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always, praying always. What's that say? I thought for a while it said praying sometimes or praying if you feel like it. Praying always. What does always mean? Every chance you get? With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Praying always. With all prayer means there's different types of prayer. So there's no shortage of ways that we can pray. Now tonight what I'm going to talk about, this isn't going to be a real deep, heavy thing, but I want to talk to us about why we cannot go without prayer. Okay? Now, don't get convicted, or, but if you need to up your game, up your game. But prayer is real easy to forget about. And sometimes we're programmed to pray only when things are going wrong or we're headed for the cliff. But prayer should be a natural release and expression from us when it's easy and when it's hard. Amen, Pastor. You're, you, you're stirring us up here. Now, because, I'll say it this way, your praise will never replace your prayer. The, the, the depth and strength of your praise will never replace your prayer. Those are two separate things. But the average Christian yields to praise easier than prayer. Okay? It's easier to do unless you're on the worship team, then you have to be here for all the, all the stuff they do. And yes, there are times when you sing your way out of the darkness. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not saying praise is not important, but I'm just saying you, you've got to have a foundation of prayer in your life. Now, write this chapter down. I'm not going to go there because uh, it's Isaiah. Isaiah 38 is a story of a guy named... Hezekiah, he was a king. And Isaiah the prophet came to, the, to his uh, palace and he said, I have a word from God for you. Get your house in order, you're going to die. Now, I wouldn't want the prophet saying that to me. And instead of Hezekiah having to come apart, Hezekiah rolled over and faced the wall and he prayed and he said, Lord, haven't I been faithful? Haven't I served you all these years? And the Lord said, yeah. 
because of your prayer, you have 15 more years. And so Isaiah, just as sure as he came into that palace, he was going through the courtyard on his way out, and the Lord stopped him and go, he said, go tell Hezekiah. He has 15 more years. I've heard his prayer. Pretty powerful. All that being said is, is we need to have an awesome respect for prayer. The ability to commune and have audience with the Most High God. That's why, that's why that devil that, that hassles you is always trying to nitpick and take minutes and then a half hour, an hour from you. I believe in prayer. I believe sometimes uh, one of the, on the little home remedies for anxiety, one of them was don't be passive, be proactive. And what that meant is, is you just don't sit around and wait for stuff to come. You, you live your life. You do what, you, what you're supposed to do. And in the realm, in the spirit, in prayer, it's, it's real beneficial when you're proactive, when you can start praying about stuff weeks before something happens. One of my favorite hobbies, maybe I, you understood it from my kid's hope story today, but I like nothing better than holding a little baby that can't get out of my arms and praying over him. So if you've, if you've ever been in this church, you've seen me during like praise and worship hold a little baby. I'm not smelling them and doing all that stuff like you guys do. I'm not. I'm praying over him. May this kid grow up to be good. May this kid be healthy. May he be a blessing or she be a blessing. You know what Kevy does to every newborn? Counts toes, counts fingers, counts ears. And as she's praying for him, I. That's pretty interesting. I wonder what we might have missed in our lifetime because of lack of. I wonder if I ever missed a warning from heaven because I didn't pray about what I was going to be doing that day or that week. And I, don't want, I don't want to miss too much. I want to be prepared for everything that comes my way. All right, go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. You all right? You, you in the groove here? That church Sunday was quiet, man. Glad to be back home. It was. The most noise we had was when Aaron started snorting over there. And it wasn't anything I said either. They were just having fun over there while I'm preaching away. They're laughing. You can't make it without prayer. Now, somebody, has anybody been paying attention to my teachings about anxiety and, and doubt and fear? What does Philippians 4, 6 say? It says, be anxious, but by everything, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, okay? And so I, I, I connected the dots, low prayer, high anxiety, Exo elevated prayer, more prayer, lower anxiety, okay? Pretty simple, isn't it? It's all tonight, as I'm reminding you, pray. Pray. I don't care if one thing changes or it doesn't change. You pray and you pray in faith. I like to tell people, I'm not just praying, I'm praying and believing with you. Good deal, huh? When I don't know what to do, I pray. Sometimes even when I know what to pray about, I pray before I pray about it, just in case the Lord gives me a nudge one way or the other. But we're not going to make it in 2024 if we don't have a strong, stable prayer life. Now, verse 8, Matthew 5 and 8. Anybody know what this passage is called? The Beatitudes. Anybody ever read these? You ought to ask your preacher to preach from them and see what, what comes up. Verse 8 is real interesting. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who will see God? Now, does that mean you're perfect? You... No? Does it, does it imply you're trying to be godly and perfect? I mean, that's all the more I can ask of you to do. Okay? And, you, and it'll get better and better. But blessed are those who have a pure heart. Well, around that, make a little note that one of the first things prayer does is it empties the cares. It empties your heart of its cares. 
Everybody in here is carrying something. And here, being the man of faith and power, it'll all work out. I don't have all the details, but it'll all work out. Okay? I'm not going to let go of God. I'm not going to cast away my confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Prayer empties that junk that's built up in me. Um, we live in a really strange society. The average person that you'll cross paths with uh, is probably not the kindest or nicest person you'll meet. You, you don't get to choose who you work, you work with unless you're the boss. I remember back in the days when I worked construction and when, when I worked as that equipment operator, I worked with some guys that were not nice men. They had vulgar mouths. They were racist. They were opinionated. Eight hours a day felt like I was going to jail sometimes. I, I mean, it was a pain being around them. And I felt like I almost wanted to take a shower. Well, I did take a shower, a Holy Spirit shower, like get this, get this off of me. Bad news, disappointments, all that stuff collects in there. It's like cholesterol in your heart. And uh, I have found from experience, not so much personally, even though I've had a taste of it personally, uh, I've been through seasons of disappointment and, and, and challenges. It seems all I'm trying to do is live right and obey God, and it seems like if it can go wrong, it goes wrong. And after a while, I'm thinking, why pray? I mean, I'm praying, it seems like I'm sinking instead of floating. And so there's that part of my human mind that says, this isn't working. But thank God for the Holy Ghost on me. Because the Spirit's like a bother, man. It's always coming up. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will allow me to whimper like a little boy and then say, enough, let's get back to work. Okay? Have you ever experienced a season where it just... It's not that your prayer got answered or didn't get answered. It's like the opposite is coming. What is that? Do you think that by the time a prayer leaves your mouth and goes to heaven and the provision or blessing or whatever it is you're asking for comes to you, do you think there might be a demon or two that gets in the way to try to interfere and get you, out of that, get you off the path you're supposed to be on or just complicate things? This, this is a cool verse. Pure in heart, it comes from the word katharos. The Greek word is katharos. We call it a kather thin, flexible tube that's inserted into a part of the body to inject or drain away fluid or to keep a passage open. This might be too, too graphic for you, but I was Nick's aide for a lot of years. One of the skills I learned, I don't put it on my resume, but I learned how to cath him. And every four hours he had to be cathed. I never saw that coming. So if you all have a problem... Be of <laughs> her face she went <laughs> like no I'm good I'm good <laughs> okay I'm kidding about that I don't operate a cath service anymore okay but I do know how to do it I know how to put those leg things on I know how to transfer I know how to do a Hoyer lift I know how to do all that junk may I never do it again Okay? But it's not hard to pick up junk on planet Earth. Just watch a TV show. And they'll, they imply all kinds of stuff. Listen to the music. I was, have you heard of the country guy, a uh, new country guy named Jelly Roll? He served a term in prison and he got all tatted up. And he, he's a big guy, man. He's like 400 and some pounds. The guy can sing. Uh, the other night he won an award and I, Corey and Kevin and I were watching it, and as he went up, he, I mean, like they took four jackets and sewed them together, and, and uh, I told him, I said, that guy's so big, it looks like Corey's giving him a piggyback ride. He just was huge, and he had a hard time walking. It was funny, wasn't it? Or said, I said, I'm giving him a piggyback ride. Yeah. Car hey, carrying extra weight's a hard on you. But anyway, he has a, his first number one hit. I Forgive me, I won't sing it for you, and I don't know if Charity knows it yet, but he sings the whole song about how bad he is. He, he sings about 
how he's bound by all these things. And it's got a nice little beat and rhythm to it, and I found myself singing along to it one day until I heard what I was singing. Then I thought, I'm not confessing I'm lost. I'm not confessing I'm no good for you. And no, 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 I don't know. You don't have to go buy the CD or anything, and don't write him any mean letters because he got born again. Maybe we should see if he'll come sing for us. Yeah. Pretty cool. But I'm just thinking, I don't want to be singing that. Let that circle through my system. Uh Uh-uh, no way. We're not singing that song ever. (laughs) Yeah, you work around people. People can mess with you, and by the end of the day, end of the week, your attitude can change. I know you're Bible, Spirit-filled, New Life Victory Church Christians, but our attitudes can change. Put us in the right environment around the... Everybody has a type of person that they like. And everybody has a type of person that can bring the crazy out of you. That was good, wasn't it, Elijah? Yeah. And so the, the sooner you figure out who's who, the, the less problems you're going to have. But nonetheless, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about me clearing the junk out of my heart. Every bad thing that's been said about me, every lie, every judgment, I let it go. I don't nurse it, hearse it, and re, you know, repeat it over and over. I don't tell everybody about it. I, I get rid of it. Dig a hole and bury it. Go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, first chapter. How about that? Can I make it any easier? Unless you want me to walk around and turn it in your Bible for you. Then I'd have a new precedence. And I don't want to do that. Let's see. Hmm. So good. Uh, Verse 1, Now there was a certain man in Ramatham, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elhu, and the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, the Ephraimite. Man, those are some cool names. This is crazy here. And he had two wives. How many wives did he have? How many should he have? You mean two's not good? No? Here, Kev, I bought you a dishwasher today. Here here she is. (laughs) I don't think. (laughs) See, she can't even, we can't even joke about it. She's, She's, no, no, no. No. (laughs) How many wives did he have? Do you think these two women got along? They were besties? No? Pretty sure? The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up to the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. Uh Uh-oh, he had a favorite. He loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely. Who's, who's Hannah's rival? Come on, say it. doesn't matter if you say it wrong. Nobody knows. You, now, honestly, just let's try to think. Were women back there different? We're like, I'm so sad you don't have babies. No, you think she rubbed it in, and you think she reminded her of it, and probably had a nickname or two. I, I'm a been, I've been a male all my life. Sorry, that comes strange. Uh, <laughs> But I got to clarify that. I didn't have an operation or anything. Well, help me dig a hole here, guys. I'm, I had three brothers, so I didn't, you know, women were and kind of still are. But it took me a little bit, but I learned out women can be mean. They can be competitive. Yeah, nasty. Except when they get born again 
and filled with the mighty Holy Spirit and come to church. Then they get sweet as could be. Then, I'm prophesying. Then they get sweet as could be. They let stuff go. They don't talk about it. They don't plot revenge. You're under construction. May that part of the project be done first. <laughs> One time my mom was going to discipline me and I ran away and she couldn't catch me because I was a little older then. And she just stopped and said, you'll have to sleep sometime. I thought, I don't like this. I don't understand what that means, but I don't, I don't like the sound of that. I did find out. Don't mess with sweet mama Joe. Okay, let's, let's keep going here. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. That sounds like a modern sermon right there, doesn't it? I, want, I wonder what the Elkin is doing, man. These two women are going at it. It'd be an awkward spot. Anyway, it's his, his problem. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why, you, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? We'll leave that out there. <laughs> so Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. What was she in? Imagine what is that? Huh, is that like a pain so deep in your heart? that One thing I found about that kind of pain is I found out, I hope nobody asks me any questions about that. Because every time I talk about it, it's like it twists even more. Anyway, she was in bitterness of soul. So this wasn't a pretty polished prayer, was it? Bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. That means he's going to be a priest. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered, and I got to imagine she snapped back at him a little bit. I don't think she said, pardon me, sir. Pardon me, Padre. Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I've spoken until now. Now, do you know what happens after this? He prophesies. Next year, this time. It's going to happen. Now, what's cool is that that's an ultimate sewing thing right there to give up a baby. She went on to have more kids after that. That's pretty cool. But she prayed and she was in bitterness of soul and she said she has a sorrowful spirit. Picture her praying. Her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out. Maybe because she was in that much pain. I have to believe it's something she prayed before, but here technically is what I says happened. She unloaded on God. She said, this ticks me off. I don't want to be this way. I hate it when Panini, the taco head, picks on me. Now, I am no way, in, in no way am I saying to be disrespectful and ir irreverent to God. Okay? But there is a time where you tell God what's in your heart. You don't have to do it publicly in front of everybody. But it is a very healthy thing to say, I, listen, this here is too much. And, and in these times, 
for a woman to be barren, that was a, considered a curse, that you had done something wrong. Okay? But she unloaded on God. Hmm. Then she became pregnant. The question I ask you is, how can you go to a holy God with all that clutter in your heart? I'm just asking. Sometimes too much clutter in your heart, the closer you get to His holiness, it kind of starts burning and you get uncomfortable. <laughs> Is that a reason why a, a, a Jesus-loving Christian has a very tiny prayer life? They just, they're worried about their kids, they're worried about money, they're worried about work, they're worried about inflation and on and on. There's no lack of anything to worry about. But you, you have to know what's yours to carry and what's not to carry. Got it? What's the first thing that prayer does? Isn't that good? That's why your personal prayer time is very important. Okay? The next thing is why you can't make it with prayer is prayer acknowledges that the answer is beyond your human abilities. Prayer acknowledges that the answer is beyond your human abilities. Uh, that's why, I don't want to say, it, well, I'll say it this way. It's easier for women to go before the Lord than it is for men. Because men, we have this, I can fix it. I can build it. I can put it back together. I can work triple shifts for eight months and get it done. And, and men, God will give us something we can't fix. Women, I, is it that w because women are physically not as strong as men or women are smarter than men? They're smarter. <laughs> I, re I read a brief article that said women live to be, I don't know what, they put up 83 or 84 and the average man dies at 75 and they said, do you know why men die before women do? And a woman, you know what the woman answered? Women are smarter. They don't jump out of trees. They don't see how far something can fly. They, they don't tinker with explosive stuff. They, <laughs> I don't know. I can't confirm that. Pray, prayer causes you to humble yourself. You hear me? Prayer causes you to humble yourself. Now, here's, here's how it works here. I could pray for all of you. Kevin, I pray for you throughout the day and so forth. But, for instance, if you come up to me and say, Pastor, I, I would like you to pray for me, specifically, whether you tell me what the request is or whether I'll just let God tell me or I'll just pray what the Holy Spirit gives me, that's a form of you humbling yourself. Because you just don't go up to everybody and say, pray for me, do you? No. That's a dangerous thing to do. Don't be doing that. Know those who labor among you. But when you pray... You're, you're humbling yourself and saying, you are God, and I'm just a human. And I am talented, but I'm not God. And prayer also anchors itself in faith in God. Faith. We're going we're to turn up the prayer level here in church. All right, the third thing why you can't go without prayer is this. You receive di divine direction through prayer. Now, that, that, this is a one cool benefit to have as a, as a believer, divine direction, being at the right place, the right time, prepared for whatever it is. Do you remember the guy in the Bible named Jonah? He was a major prophet, and the reason I know that is because God wouldn't give a beginner a city, the biggest city, to prophesy over. Jonah was told what to do. What did Jonah do? Say, yes, sir, I'm your man. A good lesson there. He went the opposite direction. And he was hanging around a bunch of sailors. Did he fool God? Was it a coincidence that storm came? God stopped him in his tracks and they, they spun the bottle to see who was in trouble and he said, I'm the guy, throw me overboard. He was trying to get out of that assignment one way or the other. And then what happened to him? The backsliders, lifeboat picked him up and a big fish swallowed him. Now, wouldn't that be nasty? Wouldn't that be a nasty experience? Who gets motion sickness? There's not one window in that fish. And 
And then he repented. And then when that big fish came up, he was at Nineveh. That big fish could have been an angel, could have just been obeying God. But he made a major decision without praying about it. What if he had prayed? He, he told God the reason why he wasn't going to do it. He said, they're all heathens. More than likely, they'll repent. And they'll, you know, he, did, he gave the reason for it. Uh, but he never told God he wasn't going to do it. Maybe God would have changed his direction. All right, now I wish the room was full when I asked this, but has anybody ever, ever made a bad decision and you didn't pray about it? Nothing comes to mind? <laughs> now, when I, I, I'll explain it this way. When something appeals to your eyes and your soul and your appetite and everything in you says go, you just automatically assume God's in on it. And, and he knows your exact package of what you like, and et cetera. But sometimes if we're more, if we're more carnally natural than spiritual, we'll, God could say, stop, that's Ishmael. And we'll go, oh, no, it isn't. This is wonderful. And now if we go, hallelujah, go to Isaiah. Oh, we're going to pray, baby. Hey, stop that. <laughs> Divine direction through prayer. See, it's happening again. Uh-huh. Sound guilty to me. What was it? Three days in the big fish's belly made you laugh? <laughs> no, it was the book of Ishmael. I, I can see that. You'll, you'll fix him on that, won't you? All right, go, go to verse 6, please. <laughs> 9, pay attention. Is it okay to laugh in church? You hope so. <laughs> Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Just think, my God is a counselor. He's a counselor. Why don't we go to him more often? Isn't that cool? He's a wonderful counselor. I like that. That's our God. All right, go to Proverbs 3. You get divine direction. Verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I like that promise of he shall direct my path. Paths, plural. He shall direct them. That's pretty cool. But the condition is I have to acknowledge him. I, ha I have to speak with him. I have to commune with him. I have to say this is the day you've prepared for me. I'm open to any plans you have for me. If not, I'm going to do my routine. That's pretty cool. Is there anything I should know about this place I'm going? Acknowledge him. And then he'll direct your path. Oh, I like that, church. What did you look up? Counselor. 
to console. He can certainly do that. That's what he did in here last Sunday. He consoled us. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall. How about every trap a devil will set in your path and you just take another route. You just go another way. He shall direct your path. Um, prayer is our umbilical cord between heaven and earth. That's how we stay connected. Um, you ready for this? Prayer isn't done when you're done talking. Do you hear me? The average Christian, blah, 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 this and that and this and that, amen, and off they go. And the whole time the Lord's going, as soon as he pauses, okay, have you ever been trapped by somebody who talks a lot? And you're, you're waiting for a 10-second break to either run for it or, or say what you got to say? And I don't want to be that way to God. I don't want to get to heaven and say, why this stuff happened in my life, he said, and have him say, well, I was going to tell you, but you'd never stop talking. And once you stopped talking, you never stayed tuned into the Spirit. So there is part of your prayer time where you can sit and be quiet. I know that might be the hardest thing God ever have you do. Yeah, it's not done. And you know the beauty about God is we cannot manipulate God under any circumstance. And there's some, there's some swift manipulators in the earth, but you can't do it before God. God knows there's only one way to get his power working in your life. Hallelujah. I don't know. I'll save this for the next time. Did you learn anything about prayer? Other than your pastor can say, just do it. Be a doer of the word. It's a priority. Remember Hezekiah, 15 more years because he prayed. That's a, that's a powerful promise. And you don't have to be a big shot and have a national ministry. You just have, have to have a voice in faith. Amen? All right, close your Bibles. We're going to get free bacon at Culver's. It's not free, and it wasn't free that day either, was it? Sounds kind of fishy to me. Sounds like bacon. Ba you like bacon, Oliver? Oliver eats bacon? Doki does? I'll keep that in my back pocket when I need to bribe him. All right, stand up. <laughs> you eat bacon, Charity? You're a sausage girl? I eat it all. Hallelujah. I like my bacon crispy, though. Might even a tad bit burnt. But I'll eat it any way you put it on my plate, too. Here we go. Is she prophesying, or is that just her? Oh, Father, thank you for bacon. Thank you for good things that you give us. Thank you, Father, that we're going to reach deeper into the realm of the Spirit and be prayer warriors. We can be counted on, Father. I pray that the fire of God burns in the heart of every believer. In the name of Jesus, we find prayer easy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And thank you for this food we're about